All right, everybody, welcome to Legends Radio. We've got a chock full total entertainment tonight. All kinds of the, uh, almost every genre of the arts is represented tonight. And we're going to start uh, before Chris D'Elia with Ian Edwards, who is one of the top, 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 top guys out there. You've seen him on Conan, on Live at Gotham, HBO's Bad Boys of Comedy. Uh, he has done everything, uh, played everywhere, Deaf Comedy Jam. Uh, and, and he's written for Saturday Night Live, Boondocks, which is a favorite of everybody's. Maybe we'll ask him when that's going to come back. The one and only Ian Edwards, who is at the, the punchline, I believe it is. This, let's see, uh, tonight, starting tonight. Ian, so, uh, geez, you're, you're already up here. Tonight through Saturday at the world-famous punchline in San Francisco, along with Reggie Steele and Kellen Erskine, and maybe we'll find out about all his other dates around the country. But Ian, a pleasure to have you on the show. And are you already up in the Bay Area? Yeah, I'm sitting in a vegan restaurant in the middle of Chinatown right now talking to you. Wow. You've had a pretty interesting background. You were, um, was it, uh, you were born in Africa and then went to, uh, to England or the other way around? Well, no, no, I was born in uh, England, and then I was, when I was nine years old, moved to to Jamaica. Jamaica, and, and you've lived in New York, yeah. guys. Which you've is, been all Jamaica the... is Africa. Africa is kind of like Africa. A lot of black people there. And then well, uh, moved from Jamaica the... to New York. And and now you're when in California. In, and now yeah. I'm in California. Yeah. So I'm pretty. I'm exotic. I like to tell people, well, especially girls, I'm exotic. The uh, because you know we were just looking at, at how people hopefully were getting along, and maybe that was a model for things for at least two weeks at the Olympics. What do you think? Are we still in this country like the worst for race relations, or uh, how are how do you view things now at this point? Obviously, we have a lot of improvement left on the table. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think, like, after Obama got elected, I thought things were better racially. But, you know, the, the, the more he, be, he was president, the less racial harmony I realized that we really have in this country. But, you know, it, you know humans are humans. And, that, you know, everybody just has to work on getting it. You know what I mean? And stop doing the color racial thing and hopefully one day you know this thing will be better but until then I'm just going to sleep with as many girls from other races as possible <laughs> yeah. you know create harmony you know among yeah. people <laughs> let me, let me, I'm going to bring up uh, uh, Evan Ginsberg who's right in New York City because he I've known Evan for uh, three, four decades Evan is he's dated almost every nationality he finally married uh, oh yeah, Korean lady. But Ev is right in New York. Ev, why don't you? Uh, I know you can fit in here a little better than I. <laughs> yeah, my my wife's my wife's Korean. She speaks like uh, ten words of English. Somehow it works. So that's so, hilarious. <laughs> Somehow yeah. it works. You're a genius. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just want you to yeah. know you're a genius, and a lot of men should respect you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so, are you are you a vegan? Uh, you, you said you're in a vegan restaurant. Yeah, I'm a vegan, and uh, I'm trying to eat even healthier than vegan because, you know, sometimes you eat a lot of, you can have bad, I eat fast food vegan stuff, so I'm trying to step that up and do more green vegetables and and just raw foods, you know? Huh. Like and like a, like somebody that eats raw foods will be like, you, you're unhealthy. They'll look at you, you're a vegan, you're unhealthy. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and... Yeah. Uh, what what do you think of the average American? I, I think I think so many of us are grossly out of shape and uh, eat horribly. What what's your take on that? Yeah, I just I just think people would wish wish people would eat better because then they'd be healthier and it alleviate a lot of medical problems. Like you know, a lot of things is simple. We make life complicated. If you just eat better, you'll feel better. You know, the only thing that's you can only poison you know poison yourself when you eat bad food, you know what I mean? And then, then it has adverse effects, so if you eat better, unless you get hit by a car or just something, if you get killed in an earthquake, you know, most of us would be really healthy if we ate better. Hmm. Wow. 
<laughs> that, that's great advice. And uh, I know you're in a restaurant, so I'm not going to keep you long. Uh, just, just one final question on my end. Who are some of the comedians that make you laugh? Who are some of the people that you, lo- that you enjoy seeing, listening to? Uh, well, you know, there's got the standard ones. When I started with Bill Cosby, who is like the, Bill Cosby is like the clean Richard Pryor or vice versa. And, uh, you know, George Carlin. And then, like, like contemporaries, like people that I think are funny now, like Bill Burr, uh, the late, great Patrice O'Neill, uh, J.B. Smooth, Kevin Hart. Uh, and then there's some, like, Neil Brennan is hilarious. He wrote in, he wrote in Chappelle's show. Chappelle is hilarious. Uh, Chappelle has got this amazing thing going on that you just have to be born with it. There's a new guy. His name is Gerard Carmichael. I think he might have that. Okay. You know, my, my cousin's uh, from Liverpool, and uh, we were watching Ari Spears last night uh, on cable, and my cousin's sense of humor is very different than mine, and we were both laughing. That guy's funny, too. Yeah, Ari is yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ari's a, Ari's a funny dude. Yeah, no a lot doubt. of voices and I was yeah. just with him in the Montreal Comedy Festival. Oh, okay, okay. Dr. Mike. Yeah, and I love that Ari Spears really stands up for himself. He, uh, when uh, he was having uh, problems, they were disrespecting him at Fox when he was on Mad TV. I think he, uh, he let people know. And, and, you know, sometimes you guys really uh, are working endlessly for w- whether it's a network or a cable channel. And, uh, you know, it, it's tough. I, I think you've got to stand up for yourself and get your piece of the pie Tell us a little bit how, uh, I know you're eating, so I don't want to disturb your meal. How, no, I'm, good. I'm, how you... I'm at the end of the meal. Are you? So I'm, I'm okay. good. Yeah. I timed it perfectly. Your, your, your dessert. This conversation is dessert. <laughs> Let's just radio is the dessert. How did you get into uh, to comedy and then end up writing for some of the biggest shows uh, on TV and cable? Well, like, it's funny. Like, when I, when I first got here, I was like 17, and it's like, even though Jamaicans speak English, it's a broken English, and then you're in a new environment, and you have to, like, make new friends and meet new people and learn how to communicate in their language. And language meaning, like, not English, but, like, what are people into in America? You know, like, I had to learn, like, music and, and talk sports. I had to learn sports. And one of the things that helped me make friends was there was another friend of mine. I was working at a Burger King. And his name was Greg Ellis. Funny dude, and everybody loved him. When he worked, the ship went faster. And then I realized that I was funny, but I forgot that I was funny because I just moved to another country and my world was shaken up. So then I started tapping into my sense of humor. And then from there, one day, I was taking orders on the Burger King drive through and I always used to use them, just clown around when I was taking the order, make people laugh. And one guy pulled around, and he was like, hey, man, you're funny. Did you just take my order? I said, yeah. He said, you should be a stand-up comic. And I like taking advice from strangers. <laughs> and uh, so apparently I took it and said, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20s. What am I doing with my life? Let me, let me try this. So I started going down to the local comedy club and checking out some of the shows. And then went and on, got some material together, tested it on some people during conversation without them knowing, had like five or six jokes that would work. And, and then uh, went to the comedy club one night, signed up for the open mic and then bombed. And then from there, just kept on bombing until I could get my nerves together. And then once I get my nerves together and start performing and start doing good. And I think like being a fan of like Richard Pryor and, Bill Cosby let me let me down the right comedy path as far as being original and being an honest artist, and that helps you get further in the business. And that helped me get writing jobs on SNL and The Boondocks. And well, you, you can't go wrong picking total legends like that and George Carlin and uh, God, I, I miss uh, uh, Dave Chappelle. I wish you know, he comes out every now and then. I'm sure I probably more places than just New York and San Francisco, but he filled in for somebody last year. Forget who it was, a rap star at one of our big Outland festivals, and 
the guy didn't show, and uh, it was just boom, total surprise. Dave Chappelle, the people really went out of their way, and people go nuts for you. They really want you to succeed. So on the Boondocks, I get really frustrated. I used to know one of the writers and lost mm-hmm. touch with him, but there's this long you know? lag. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but uh, he was at, at a, a wrestling convention of all things in Las Vegas. But I was getting on his case. I'm going, what, what is this lag? Why three, four years? That's worse than The Sopranos. So yeah. what's, what's going on with that? Because uh, the, the genius author stopped doing the daily comic strip, which we all lamented to do, right. I guess, put his energies into the show. But there was, I don't know, how many years between the first and second season? And that's been it. So is there going to be a third season? And when? Or what's, the, what's going on? I think I think there was a third season. I think they just got renewed for the fourth. I'm not involved with them anymore. I think they just got renewed for a fourth. And then I think he lost some of the crew, like one of the producers. His name is Carl. I forgot Carl's last name. Carl is involved with Black Dynamite on on uh, Adult Swim right now. And Carl is just an amazing dude. He was there when I was there. They had a they had a great team. They got Rodney Barnes. I don't I don't. This is how good Rodney Barnes is. I don't even like him, but he's funny. <laughs> I and, just uh, uh, Aaron Magruder. Aaron, oh, Aaron yeah, Magruder is Aaron genius. Yeah, genius. Well, just like Eric Andre. Have you seen? I'm sure you've seen his show. Eric Andre, I think, is genius. Yeah. Genius. Yeah, I, I like how I like how Adult Swim allows Eric Andre to proudly be the white black guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> No, I like that. It's, it's beautiful. It's like, and he's like, and he has no inhibitions. He's just out there, and he just goes for it. And I like that. Yep, that was uh, well, true. Of the Boondocks. Um, are you still on Punk on MTV? I, you know, it's hard because Boondocks and Punk they don't get the PR, you know, in the written media, so people know what's going on, or the the general audience that would flock to these shows if they knew they were back on. Yeah, they were good TV. Like Punk is back on, but you can only do that for like one season. Or else, you know, you try to do another season. It, you know, the ele- it's an element of surprise. You're trying to surprise celebrities, and they watch the show because their friends are getting punk, so you'll get recognized. I only did it one season. I think everybody everybody does it one season. It's a, a little like Sasha Baron Cohen. You have to sort of pick your spots and then get out of the spotlight for a while because everybody knows. Uh, yeah, your as far as that concerned, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, because of your unique background, we've got. England, the U.S. now, Jamaica. For example, during the Olympics, who were you rooting for, you know, in terms of medals? Were you going crazy when Bolt uh, was doing all of his amazing things? Uh, most definitely. That's the beauty of being from, like, three countries. Like, you can't lose during the Olympics. <laughs> it's like, it like, America got, how many medals did America got? Yeah. Too, too, too many. It's not fair. Too uh, many. 52, oh. 52 golds or something. All right, so I'm going to say America got 52 gold, Jamaica got 10, and England got 30. Add that all up. I got all those medals. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I got extra medals. Like, if you're from one country, you only get what your country got. You know, but I, you know, I lived in three, all three countries, so I just keep all those medals, like, in my mind. So that, that was the beauty of the Olympics. Like, I, I was rooting for, like, three different countries. Uh, and speaking of race, uh, besides discussing race relations and stuff, you also talk about uh, shark attacks in your act, which is so relevant now where people are getting bitten left and right on both coasts. Uh, is that like a passion of yours? or? Well, well, no, it's, it's, a, it's an older bit, but God bless the sharks <laughs> alive. <laughs> You know, you know, I got, you know, I got to give them a, all the sharks, great whites, great, you know, a major shout out for keeping this joke alive. You know, keep. <laughs> so I don't, don't want to, I don't want to say keep doing your thing, but when, when you, when they do their thing, then I'm, I'm able to do this joke and, and they make it relevant. So I wish people would be careful in the water, <laughs> but if they're not, I kind of will make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so so now you're starting tonight. You're at San Francisco's historic punchline, and uh, the weather is is finally pretty good again, all the way through Saturday. And uh, oh yeah, you know what? We had 
We had David Allen Greer on a couple of months ago, who I've been trying to get oh. at least a good year. And we were talking about the new in Living Color. So you're going to be a writer for that. Are you going to be an on-air talent as well? No, I'm a, I'm a writer on it. And we, we, we wrote it, like, we wrote the pilot in the beginning of the year. I don't know what Fox is going to do with it, but we wrote it, like, we finished it in April. And I worked with David Allen Greer before, too. Like, he, he's, a, he's a really talented dude, man. He's super oh. talented. Like, there's oh, talented just... people, and then there's super talented. He's super talented. Yeah, I worked with him for, he had a show on Comedy Central called The Chocolate News, and I wrote on it. Oh, that was I when I, I I missed that show. That show was just first rate, uh, and it's a shame. Like Sarah Silverman's, I don't understand Comedy Central. It, 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 I mean, that should have just been picked up. No brainer. Yeah, they, you know, I guess they're trying to save money. But something's expensive, and they, you know, correlated with the ratings. They didn't like, we can't keep doing this. Well, I think they should do some shows like that that are expensive. Combine it with their expenses, their cheap shows that make money, and then I think everything will balance out because they'll have more variety. But I think they're just going towards the cheaper shows. The show is so brilliant. The uh, the monologue at the beginning, and then uh, whatever you call it at the end, uh, when he get up there and tie up the loose ends and and the skits, uh, just yeah, it was brilliant he's, stuff. He's amazing in those sketches. I'd be looking at it like, God damn, this dude is amazing. <laughs> very chameleon like well that's how he was on in living color so um can you tell us anything about this show will uh, will there be any nods to past bits or is everything new and fresh from the start well well fox has it they had it for a while so i don't know when they're going to air it if they're going to air it but everything is new cash is new and uh all the bits are new so you know they'll they'll announce when they're going to drop it and you know, I hope everybody checks it out if they do drop it. Speaking of dropping it, ianedwardscomedian.com is his website. And yeah. I couldn't find I was trying to. you got to get on your webmaster's case. I was trying to look up and read aloud your upcoming uh, gigs, where you are in the rest of the country. Do you know where else you're playing other than tonight through Saturday at uh, the Punchline in San Francisco? Where else are you around the country? Well, that's that's the, that's what I was gonna do. I was gonna give you the website, but so people could track down the rest of the dates. Cause I'm a bad self promoter and I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But uh, if uh, people follow me on Twitter, like at Ian Edwards Comic, then uh, then they can. I'll always tweet when I have dates. So at Ian Edwards Comic, and then I'll get on the webmaster for real, for real, and uh, fix that. Cause you should be there. Should be a link you can click on these the dates. But it's very cool when you go on there, the full screen is you performing at ianedwardscomedian.com. And uh, just an honor. And you were just so creative, involved with so many things. Do not miss him. Ian Edwards is going to be a scream and will make you think. The punchline starting tonight through Saturday in San Francisco. And then don't forget ianedwardscomedian.com. Anything that we left out? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. It probably is, but I probably won't remember it till after we hang up. Till exactly after we hang up. But yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully they've got some vegan uh, or healthy uh, organic fortune cookies for you there. All right. The great Ian yeah. Edwards. <laughs> We're going to come right back with Chris D'Elia right here on Legends well, Radio. Thank you very much, man. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, we are continuing with our geniuses of comedy on uh, network television, and there is none bigger. Everybody, of course, loves uh, Whitney Cummings' show, Whitney, on NBC. We had her on uh, right when she was helping uh, Jenny McCarthy and Heather McDonald and uh, Chelsea Handler do uh, big charity a couple years ago here in San Francisco. So starting, I believe, Friday. Is it Friday? Uh, For Chris D'Elia... Where the hell? It's no, it's Thursday through Sunday at Cobb's in San Francisco. Chris, are there some more tour dates? We're gonna. I wanted to get, go right from the get go. I see all the other ones. You just did Brea, California, down the. Yeah, kind of- I I uh, I'm just doing Cobb's this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, then I go back to shooting Whitney. Actually, so I'll be back in L.A. Which is so it's a rarity, or it's a. Uh, a real treat and a rare occasion and can't miss to come and see you uh, in San Francisco, which is a major deal then. It'll be the last uh, tour date I'm doing for, for the, at least the next few months. Yeah. So right. otherwise you got to come to LA and see me on the weekend. Uh, the last factory of the country store. 
congratulations on the show being picked up. We're all excited because she is just about the most talented person in the world, and she's now kind of introduced you, hopefully, to a bigger audience. Of course, your special on Comedy Central just re-aired, uh, what was it, like a week ago. It was back on there. and Hopefully, you're getting the deserved residuals from that. Yeah, the residuals from the special aren't that great. <laughs> I know. But, uh, no, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing, uh, yeah, they keep re-airing that. They re-air that like every month or so, so that's good for me. Man. Um, how did that gig, now you guys were friends, were you, uh, you've done stand-up with her before quite a bit, and that's kind of how that came about, you playing the spousal equivalent on the show? Uh, we were on, we did stand-up together, we did like, uh, um, uh, open mics together. I started like about six and a half years ago doing stand up, and then she started a little bit before that. But she wrote the, she ended up writing the part with me in mind for it. I had to uh, obviously still go in and audition for NBC and everything, and uh, I won them over. Uh, the, as she dragged you on the pan, well, she, of course, when she hit it big with the two shows, one uh, on CBS, yeah. one on NBC, which has never been done before. And by a female, oh. that's a huge, major deal. Yeah. Kudos, kudos to her on that. But has she dragged you on before that? Because she came to everybody's, uh, on everyone's radar on Chelsea. Has she dragged you on the panel for that before? She's not me, dude. No, she produced uh, a show, a stand-up show. She gave me my first stand-up. She produced a show called Live Good Comedy. I don't, know, I don't know if we're losing you if you're in a tunnel. But uh, we're talking to Chris D'Elia. His website is C-H-R-I-S, his first name, D-E-L-I-A, dot com. And uh, Chris, if you can hear me, of course, uh, NBC set records for coverage with the Olympics, your network, and uh, hopefully it's bringing them back into prominence and they've got a huge uh, sort of fire in their butt. Uh, any thoughts on the Olympics on NBC and, and a lot of the cool stuff that happened there? Record number of... Uh, we just were talking to Ian Edwards and he... It's like, uh, oops, I think we lost Chris. Uh, maybe we should give Chris a call back if he's not there. All right, everybody, we're back here at Legends Radio with Chris D'Elia. His uh, website's his first name, and then D-E-L-I-A dot com. Chris, uh, we just had uh, Ian Edwards on, and we were talking about the Olympics because he uh, lived in England and Jamaica and the U.S., you know, and all that stuff with uh, Bolt uh, and all of that. And I was saying NBC really... I think they're they're saying it's the most watched event ever in TV history, your network, NBC, and now they've got a fire up their butt. Uh, so I was asking you, any thoughts on the Olympics? Uh, that was you know, a, I, I, it was on, it was on, by the way, I love Ian Edwards. He's one of my good friends. Uh, but he was on, uh, the Olympics were on whenever I slept, though. I didn't watch any of it. <laughs> it just, it just, they air at like, you know, 1 a.m. to like, what? 10 a.m., so I'm done. Uh, that's, when I, that's when a comic sleeps. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, you can I either DVR it or, or watch the live streams or stuff like that, which, you know, I, yeah. you can't please everyone. Everyone's bitching about that, but most families do sit down between 8 and 11 Pacific time, not yeah. comics, which are on a whole different uh, schedule and stuff. But uh, it's good to see, I guess the bottom line, it's good to see NBC is is back to prominence. Because, I mean, they always were until just a couple of years ago. And, you know, you even hear Jay Leno making fun of them and stuff like that. And, I, you know, for God's sakes, uh, Thursday nights were NBC territory for, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years and all that. So, so when is uh, the show Whitney going to be on now? Because I know they bumped it at least once. And uh, that always pisses me off. You know, you want the audience to get used to because people are simplistic sometimes, and they got to get yeah. used to uh, the time and date. So, wh when is Whitney going to be on now? In just like less than a month. Uh, it will be on in Oct on October thirteenth. I think we we do we're on Fridays now at eight o'clock. Oh, Fridays! It, why aren't they? They should be part of the third. Well, hopefully, uh, people that love the show will bug NBC to put uh, it. You know, Thursdays or Wednesdays. They were bouncing around uh, Christina Applegate's show, too, to where you couldn't figure out when the Up All Night is going to be get, on. Did that get picked up again? I don't know if it did. Yeah, I think it, how can you lose with the, the cast they had? Three uh, uh, top people. I, I thought it did, but it was it was nice when it was paired with your show because you had a yeah, nice hour block there. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, they know what they're doing. So well, I'm not worried. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be good. And uh, Whitney's a genius. Ev, let's go to Evan Ginsberg in New York, who is our master of comedy. 
<laughs> Hi there. Um, just wondering, you're, you're on a hit uh, network show, prime time. Where would you like to go in the future, five, ten years down the road? Would you like to do a one-man show on Broadway or conquer movies? W what are some future goals? I want to do, do I've all, I want to be able to parlay this into have being in action movies, dude. That's yeah. what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to run and shoot bad guys. Well... You want to know something, uh, the B-movies of yesterday are the A-movies of today, and that's exactly what they're doing, unfortunately. That's so, right. Uh, but I want to do, I want to do, you know, I want to be, I mean, cop, a little cop, like Beverly Hills Cop, like, like funny, but also still real action, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And when you look back at your career, um, what, what do you consider some of the highlights? Um, I, anytime I, I, I'm able to do stand-up on TV, it, it makes me feel... Uh, really accomplished that makes me feel happy and uh that you know you work so hard in the trenches of uh, stand up every night at the clubs and and you know you, you try and perfect the act and then when you go on tv you know hopefully you're ready and when you can bang it out then you feel you feel really really good because you know it's all you you wrote it and, and directed it and performed it and everything and since you mentioned writing if you were to write a sitcom down the road uh what, what would you do that hasn't been done thus far? You know, I don't know. It's so tricky because, you know, you, you, everybody's always talking about, like, oh, what's different? What's, what's, what's hot? What's new? But, you know, the only thing, the, the, it seems that the things that hit the air are just pretty much kind of the stuff that everybody's familiar with. Like, I mean, how many cop shows are on TV? How many doctor shows are on TV? So I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I, I honestly never thought of myself as a multi-camera sitcom guy, but it seems to be lending itself pretty well. So to, to, to my, uh, my stuff, so I'm, I'm happy about it. There you go. Dr. Mike. Chris, we're talking to Chris D'Elia. Tomorrow night, Thursday through Sunday, San Francisco Cobbs, which is basically a rare treat for anybody around the country. So if you're coming into Northern California, he's got to be doing the taping for Whitney after that. So this is your time. That's right. and do, not oh, miss, yeah, do not miss up. Uh, your you, comedy sometimes, you know, not quite, uh, say, Pablo Francisco must sweat and burn like 10 pounds every time he gets up there. Yeah. Very physical stuff. So would you like to see yourself uh, like with Randy Couture in Expendables 2 or Expendables 3? Dude, you have no idea. I would love that. <laughs> Do you, you follow that. you follow MMA like that? It's sliced alone with the these two movies, the the second installment coming up in a week. He's got like every action adventure star who's ever done anything, and when you look at uh, both yeah. of them, I can't wait to see that. I uh, I am uh, I'm not an MMA fan at all. I don't care about that stuff. I just uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of action movies. You know, I, I do think Randy Couture is you know really great. Uh, but honestly, I don't really know too much about MMA. Well, we heard that whether Chuck Zito claimed that he uh, kicked Jean Claude Van Damme's butt in a. Uh, he's a Howard Stern guy now, but he uh, used to be head of the Hell's Angels, and I think he's even in the second installment with. Oh, is Chuck that right? Van the two of these guys, uh, along with Eddie, everybody else, Bruce Willis, and of course Schwarzenegger and Stallone, and a zillion other guys. Um, another of your interests, or something that you're very good at, and I think you've done everybody's podcast. Podcasts are really big. Comics I know. are taking it onto their own. Gervais first, and Adam Carolla, who you've done, yep. and uh, Mark Marone, you know, just exploding all over the place. Uh, but you've also done uh, stuff with the brilliant Will Sasso, Brian Callen, and uh, tell us yeah. a little about the the podcast stuff you do. I have a, yeah, I have a podcast called the Ten Minute Podcast. Basically, it was Will Sasson's idea. You know, Will, he played Curly in the Three Stooges, and he, uh, uh, and also in the Three Stooges movie, and then he was on Mad TV with Brian Callen, the other guy on the podcast. But it's basically just the three of us just messing around for 10 minutes. I mean, I don't know. Will had the idea to do it. You know, well, everyone's got a podcast is an hour and a half, two hours. Why don't we just do 10 minute podcasts twice a week? And so it's just us goofing off, uh, really quickly. And it seems to be doing really well. We're in, we're in, uh, we're up there on the, one of some of the top ranking podcasts. So yeah, 10 minute podcast. That's almost like the uh, the Twitter uh, of podcasts. Only ten minutes, and you probably accomplish more than a lot of people that you know. Uh, well, you know, a lot of people's commute, a lot of people's com a lot of people's commute to work is uh, you know thirty forty minutes. So it's like you know you listen to three or four of them. 
Well, that's true. Yeah, that definitely. Because, and Will Sasso, of course, does the best John Madden in the business and uh, many other impressions. One of the best guys, if not the best. Will you tell him we miss his show on TBS? I don't know what happened. Like most things. No, 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 no. That, you're thinking of, um, uh, that's not Will Sasso. That's, oh, the, uh, guy from, the other guy from Mad TV, because Will was on John, Mad TV. Uh, John, the other, uh, what's the guy's right. name? John, the other guy is a Madden impression. What's his name? You're right. But Will Will was on Mad TV, obviously. Caliendo, Frank Caliendo, Frank Caliendo. You're thinking. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, Will, uh, would you take on something like that? I mean, he's taking on the iconic Curly of the Three Stooges. Was he nervous at all when you you probably? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, I know he was nervous. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I don't think anybody could have done that but him now in the, uh, as a contemporary actor. I mean, he's just he so fits the bill and he's so physical. He's 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 a big guy, but he's also you know. Light on his feet, which is what Curly exactly was. I can't think of anybody else like that. He's such a good actor. And what a surprise casting for uh, Larry Fine. That kind of blew me away, the guy from Wealth and Grace. That was, that was pretty impressed with the, the whole thing. So hopefully there'll be more of that. So Frank Caliendo, I apologize. He is the best uh, John Madden in the business and uh, right. brilliant stuff. Um before we let you go, too, who are some of the comics, uh, Evan usually asks this, but who are some of the comics that influenced you and that you like to watch today? Because you're around everybody that's creative. I like, uh, I used to watch Eddie Murphy and Jim Carrey. Those two guys were big, big, big for me to, to watch and, and kind of really inspired me. Guys that I watch now, I really am, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Bill Burr and I'm a big fan of, uh, I love Louis C.K. and Kevin Hart. Well, when you mentioned Bill Burr and, and some of the rest of those guys, have you been on uh, Opie and Anthony's show back in uh, New York when you head back east at all? No, I, I haven't, not yet. Um, I don't really get back east too much, but I haven't been on their show. I'm sure I will. Their stuff is great. So, Yeah, I think they're like the, one of the more, I, they're probably the most friendly, comic friendly, other than maybe Howard Stern. Of uh, all the late night shows before we let you go, who would you say, I'm sure you've done your share of them, but who would you say is the most comic friendly? Would it be Conan or Jimmy Fallon on NBC? Or? I've only done, I've, honestly, I've, I've only done uh, Leno. So uh, I, I, um, well, I did Lopez. I did stand up with Lopez. But Leno, I was on the couch. And that was really cool just to, to, to shoot, uh, shoot the breeze with Leno. It was really awesome. It was fun. You know, and he, he came to the breeze. I know we talked a little bit beforehand and we, we talked about stand up and back in his day and then what it's like now. It was just, it was so cool, man, to get an argument about that. Well, I've got to say, your show is so cool. Whitney is the absolute greatest. Uh, and do not let them uh, shoot the gun on getting you guys married, like on Moonlighting. You've got to keep that tension going. Uh, I know. Sure you, you don't want to uh, jump the shark because you guys are just getting fleshing out the character. I know. Right now. I know. It's just getting good now, so we'll. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what the plans are, but uh, I'm sure it'll be good. Damn it. So they're, they're not bringing Whitney up until October. Everybody keep your eyes uh, set to the, the web or go to his site, obviously, com. He'll tell you when, he, when and where everything is happening. And uh, the show is Whitney on NBC. Chris D'Elia, one of the top, top, top guys out there. And we're going to be right back with more of Legends Radio. Thanks. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, all right, Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio, and you've been listening to the music of Shabu, and he's, he'll be joining us in an hour or so um, right here on Legends Radio, as will Mike Silva, boxing writer, uh, filmmaker Mark Nowatoski, and the legendary Chuck McCann all coming tonight, and as always... The comments, the opinions of anyone else here on Legends Radio, not necessarily shared or endorsed by U.S. Truly. Shout out to Johnny Video, who's uh, always so supportive of the show. And check out our uh, buddies at Bud and Roach, the Bud and Roach radio show, Bud and Roach, R-O-A-C-H dot com. And uh, also a very, very eclectic mix. They have musicians, they talk politics, filmmakers, etc. So on. If you like Legends Radio, you'll enjoy the Bud and Roach show, and you'll also enjoy Smart Mark Radio, which isn't just wrestling either. So, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, what's been doing out there? In, uh, is, before I get into it, is Smart Mark Radio, is that done by our friend, uh, too? Johnny Video's on there. Johnny yep. Video. Yep. Very, very good stuff. 
Um, well, I want to dedicate the show. You know, we always have people pass all the time, but there was really no nicer person in pro wrestling. A guy I started shooting pictures of in the ring in 1970, total wrestling legend. But this was a guy, and his name was Red Bastien, of course. I worked with him at Cauliflower Alley uh, from 1986 on and 19. Or excuse me, 2000 is when he took over for seven years as president and then uh, was hit very quickly with Alzheimer's, which was a shame because Red had one of those memories. He, as a teenager, before he even had pro wrestling training, worked on those at Carnival shows, which was the predecessor to pro wrestling. He and Sputnik Monroe are about the only guys I know who actually did any of that stuff, uh, which is, you know, tr total carny. And uh, Red was like the nicest guy in the world. He, I mean, very few wrestlers could consider themselves friends of even the promoters. And, and Red was friends with uh, Mike LaBelle and Roy Shire, Vince McMahon Sr., Bill Watts, of course, who was one of his roommates, Eddie Graham, everybody. I mean, he, the Sheik, he worked for everyone. And we're having Mark uh, on, and we'll talk about the Sheik. But amongst his best friends were Ray Stevens, Nick Bockwinkel, uh, Bobby Heenan, Peter Mavia, Dick Byer, uh, Vern Gagne, who we worked for. The list goes on and on. He uh, just an amazing, amazing person. And uh, it was sad when Alzheimer's just took him like, boom, like that. And, uh, you know, just a shame. We also lost uh, boxer Michael Dokes. We were the three of us were talking about. Really? Boxing. When was this? Uh, a couple of days ago, it, you know, he just had a heart attack. I didn't even, attack. I didn't even hear him. I saw him defend his title at the Garden, and I think it was the only heavyweight title fight that I ever saw live that I can remember, and it was a really big deal. Michael Dokes, and it was only like the early 90s. It wasn't that long ago. No, it was a huge wow. deal. I think he was one of many that when Tyson unified all the belts, uh, he beat him. But, yeah, he was like a young guy. I don't even know. He was around 50, 54 Somewhere thereabouts, the legendary Helen Gurley Brown, who was a total legend, uh, you know, Cosmopolitan magazine and all that stuff. Sex and the Single Girl. That uh, Sex and the City, the whole franchise came out of her originally because she, uh, her book was turned into a 1962 movie with Natalie Wood and Tony Curtis and all these people. And then, actually, the first time I've done this, it, Evan, isn't it called The Rainbow Room? It might be the death of The Rainbow Room at the top of 30 Rock which overlooks uh, the, uh, uh, all the skyscrapers and everything there. Uh, that's sad to report. I don't know. That's huge. It's on the front page of every day of the New York Times, how uh, that particular famous restaurant, which has been around for decades and is a landmark, there's some political fight which may shut it down and kill it for good. Uh, I haven't heard that, but, uh, you know, the rents in New York are so up seen i've seen that it's very hard no matter how legendary no matter how long running for these places to survive it's just brutal out there and a lot of americans they sit like zombies in front of a tv or a computer they just don't go out anymore and uh unfortunately so many great great venues in new york have gone by the wayside and continue to do so so i urge people to go out and support the arts support the arts. So, uh, and support you know, li little guy restaurants that aren't part of chains, uh, clubs that aren't part of chains. Uh, you want to you know, know something, Mike? I had a world class jazz band from Moscow, from Moscow, uh, down at Gizzy's the other night, and uh, they drew maybe 17, 18 people, which is, which is unfortunate. You know, one of the guys played. Blue Note, they play the finest clubs throughout Europe and uh, Russia. They come to New York and, uh, y you know, people glued to their TVs. It's like, get out of the house, folks. Come on. You know, uh, how, how great these guys were. No cover, okay, to walk into the place. World-class musician. Very frustrating. Anyway, check out G-I-Z-Z-I-S-N-Y-C.com. Com, G -I -Z -Z -I -S -N -Y -C com Next Tuesday, Teresa Sario from my movie, Teresa Sario, Alive Again, AliveAgainMovie.com. She'll be at Gizzy's. We have great, great people. Speaking of great people, we're going to take a very brief break right about now and call boxing writer and expert Mike Silver. 
All right, Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio, and our next guest is a boxing authority, a boxing author, top-notch journalist, Mike Silva. How are you tonight, Mike? Thank you, Evan. I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. And over the past few months, there's been so much controversy in boxing, particularly with the scoring of some uh, major fights, uh, particularly the Pacquiao fight, which seemed like robbery. What, what, what was your take on that? Well, you know, uh, a, a fight sometimes can be very subjective um, and difficult to score. Uh, I watched that fight without scoring it myself, listening to the announcers who were uh, very much pro Pacquiao. And uh, you hear the cheers of the audience, and sometimes subconsciously that can affect your judgment also. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Pacquiao won that fight, but I don't think it was as big a robbery as it was made out to be. I, I scored the fight. Uh, when they did the replay, I scored it myself, and I did give it to Pacquiao, but by a very close margin, one or two points, that's all. Um, you know, it, 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 when a fight uh, uh, goes this way, you, the, the first two minutes of a three-minute round, the other fighter is doing stuff, but he's not being very effective, but the other fighter is hardly doing anything. So you could say, well, you know, it seems to be uh, going towards the fighter who seems to be doing more. Uh, then you have the last minute of the round where Pacquiao would pick up the action, start coming on, sometimes only in the last 30 or 40 seconds of round. He'd land some big punches, uh, more powerful punches than the other fellow landed in the first two minutes. Now, does that sway your judgment and say, well, you know, he won the last 40 seconds big, he scored some good punches, do we give him the, the round, or do we look at the round, say, in three separate one-minute segments and decide? Um, it's never really easy to score uh, a fight that, that, that's close in this way. But looking at it carefully and trying to judge it as objectively as possible, I thought Pacquiao did deserve the win. He was more aggressive. Uh, even though he did come on in the last minute, he did land more effective punches. But... The other fellow did win a number of rounds, and uh, I don't believe, you know, I believe he did not deserve to win, but I don't think it was the out-and-out robbery that everybody thought it was. And I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Um, and let's face it, you know, bad decisions, uh, whether corrupt or just poor judgment, have been a part of the boxing scene since the sport you know, was invented. <laughs> so, right, right. Uh, and I've seen, I've also seen much more, many more outrageous decisions than this, than this one. But it's still, it doesn't help boxing, and uh, it's not good for the sport. Ironically, I thought that Marquez beat Pacquiao their last fight, and that Pacquiao mm -hmm. got a got a nice little decision there. What, what was your take on that? Yeah, I, I, I it's a very close fight. Um, it could have gone either way, in my opinion. Uh, I wouldn't have been terribly upset if uh, Marquez had won the fight. Um, I think Pacquiao is slowing down. He, o he does have trouble with fighters who are quick and can move. That's why the fight will never take place. But if, if Mayweather would ever fight Pacquiao, I would have you know, bet on Mayweather to win that fight. Oh, absolutely. And uh, tell the listeners a little about your book. It, it's a very interesting read. Um, Tell the listeners the perspective that you have in this book. Right. Well, the book is called The Arc. It's A-R-C, The Arc of Boxing, The Rise and Decline of the Sweet Science. It's been out a couple of year, years already. Um, it's interesting. I got a, 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 an interesting uh, comment on my book last night. I was, a veteran box, I was at a veteran boxing meeting, and I uh, met the, the Irish middleweight, John Duddy, who's now retired. He was active up until about a year and a half ago, very intelligent young fellow, and I told him about my book, and he said, that's amazing. He said, this is the first time I've ever heard of a book uh, of your type, and, and what he meant was my book basically is a comparison of the old-time fighters versus the modern-day fighters. In other words, old school versus new school, the fighters of the 
20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s versus the fighters, the great fighters of the last 20, 30 years. Who was better and why? And he said, you know, he said, you go into start discussing boxing with anybody. You go into bar, you, you know, you start talking boxing. There's always a debate, and the debate always centers on who was better, this old-time fighter or the modern-day fighter. You know, could Joe Lewis have beaten Muhammad Ali, right? Uh, could Rocky Marciano have taken Jack Dempsey, or Dempsey would, could have knocked out Marciano? How would that have gone? This, or could Duran, could Duran have beaten, uh, 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 you know, somebody like Henry Armstrong? These are debates that are ongoing. It's what, ma what makes boxing so much fun. And he said, you would think that there would have been a book just on this topic, devoted solely to this topic, as to who is better and why. And he says, what you're telling me is yours is the first book. And I said, you know something? I never thought of it. My book is the first book that really does a thorough analysis of old school versus new school and who is better and why. And, I, you know, in case you're wondering, but I don't think you are, Evan, I believe you have a copy of my book, you know that I lean towards the old school. Uh, boxing is basically now a lost art, and it's reflected in the poor performance of our Olympic team. This Olympic team, American Olympic boxing team, uh, had the worst performance of any American Olympic boxing team in the history of the Olympics. They didn't go home with a single medal except for the women's team, where we got one gold. And that wim woman who I saw, she seemed to have more basic skills than most of the men boxers. Wow. And I noticed that a lot of the, uh, the uh, especially the boxers from Kazakhstan, and uh, I can't remember the other former Soviet Republic country, had some quite outstanding boxers. And you could see that amateur boxers, that they are being taught in a traditional way. Uh, the American boxing has fallen to such a degree that people think that, look, look what's happened. The Europeans and the third world countries have overtaken American boxing. No, that's not so much the case. It's the case that American boxing has gone downhill so badly that uh, the Europeans and uh, uh, boxers from the third world now look even better. So that, that's the balance there. Yeah, it's, it's, you mentioned that... Uh the Klitschko's are so wooden and so dull that HBO is promoting one of their upcoming fights, and the fans themselves are going, I don't want to watch this. Well, what, what's right. your take on the Klitschko's? Well, you know, they're, fans like to see exciting fighters, especially amongst the heavyweights. I mean, the heavyweights are known for one thing, the big punch. That's why, you know, we all get excited. We used to get excited about a good heavyweight fight because it meant that the fight could end at any time and these are the big punchers. Well, Klitschko, the Klitschkos are basically safety first fighters who have a, uh, it can't be described any other way except a dull style of fighting. Robotic. It, it's, it's very robotic. It's, it's very measured, very robotic. Um, I give them a lot of credit. They don't want to take chances. They don't want to, you know, get banged up and wind up with brain damage. But they, I think the, the public recognizes that it's not so much that the Klitschkos are so outstanding, is that the heavyweight division is in the poorest state it's ever been in in years. Exactly. You know, we go back to the, the Joe Frazier's, the Ken Norton's, the Larry Holmes, um, Ali. And, and Ali, and, and, and the, the good solid heavyweights that you used to see and even bring up a jerry cooney i mean you know uh, he, i believe he would knock out both klitschkos yes. um it's just that the the heavyweight division is, is it's such a a low point now that people aren't excited about the division and you know there's an old saying as the heavyweight division goes so goes boxing um the Klitsch goes through no fault of their own. It's just that that's the type of fighters there are. They're very predictable, robotic. It seems that they could be taken. They're very slow. <laughs> they, they don't like to mix it up. But again, it goes back to what I said. It's, it's the training. The coaching is very poor. You don't have those fast, small heavyweights that we used to have, 190 to 210 pounds. That could belt out these guys weighing slow-moving guys weighing 240, 250 pounds. You just don't have it anymore. So in an era when 
skills have diminished, size, weight, athleticism becomes more important because the skill is lessened. There's no skill in somebody winning uh, a hundred meter race except that he can put one leg in front of the other faster than the other guy. Okay? In boxing, it's a skill. It's an art. If the art is lost and the skills aren't taught, then what you have are fighters who are more athletic and perhaps uh, just a little bit faster, they will begin to dominate and uh, because there's nobody out there with the skills to take them, as was the case years ago during the golden age when you had, you know, the Henry Armstrongs, the Sugar Ray Robinsons, and uh, uh, Kid Gabalon and, and, and these fighters who were just came up the hard way and they had such a brutal uh, um, learning curve with that, that really rough competition to make it. Nowadays, with, we have over 100 world champions today. Can you imagine that? Can you yeah, imagine if baseball awesome. had a dozen World Series winners? We have over 100 world, world champions. I was speaking to a fellow the other day who has a boxing website, and uh, he was asking me some questions. I'm talking to him, and I said, well, yes, you've been running this website for about 10 years. Tell me who the lightweight champion of the world is. He goes, uh, uh, I don't know. Now, here's a fellow who runs a boxing website. He didn't know who the lightweight champion of the world is. There are five of them, as a matter of fact. So that's the state of this sport. You know, the, the, nobody, there's, nobody can put any blame on mixed martial arts or anything like that. Boxing shot itself in the foot. Absolutely. And when you have all these ridiculous organizations naming champions. Absolutely. I, I, I'm sure Dr. Mike Lano in California has questions for Mike. Yeah, Mike, uh, boy, glad to have you back on the show. Yeah, the similarities in with MMA, you know, in the constant, oh, is MMA taking away from boxing fans? No, I mean, boxing has to do certain things which you can get into. But there was, uh, and Rick can probably chime in, I forget the fight, uh, just days ago was uh, Henderson the champ, the African-American gentleman, and uh, just a very unpopular, controversial decision like the Pacquiao thing. Mm-hmm. And people were screaming, who was the, the guy, Rick, that... Uh, Oh, I mean, he fought Frankie Edgar, but I mean, it, I'm sure that our guests can uh, atone for this, that, you know, that I haven't seen a boxing, MMA, or any type of fight card that doesn't have a controversial decision on it, so, I, I, yeah, you know. It, it's going to happen. It, it's inevitable. You hope it doesn't happen too often, though. That's the only thing. You, you hope to keep it to a minimum. Yeah. It doesn't, well, it doesn't always happen in boxing. It was surprising because the fight before that, you remember Pacquiao, you know, a lot of people were screaming about that, that he got the win. And right. now, you know, it was the reverse. Um, I, I don't know about the the boxing industry. Now we're hearing uh, since, uh, actually before Mayweather got out of jail, that uh, he is now, I don't know if he's leaving Golden Boy. Tell us about what's going on there. He's going to perhaps have his own company with a famous rap guy. And is that going to uh, help or hurt? <laughs> Will it take business away from, because I thought... Uh, uh, Oscar De La Hoya's company, Golden Boy, is like one of the more honest, uh, and, and the fighters, you know, love Nobody it. Nobody is honest it's... in boxing. Nobody can remain honest in boxing. Why? Why <laughs> is that? You know, with the uh, Don King uh, allegations and the and the various uh, promoters on down to the smaller ones in the old days. Well, you know, there's I... a lot of money to be made. There's there's a tremendous, uh, you know, there's a big pot of gold there for somebody who can control the name fighters and can. Uh, uh, get the HBO contracts, and uh, you know the people who came into the sport with some scruples. It just, you know, either they get out or they or they begin to play the game. Um, it's just uh, part of the the problem is there's no centralized control in this sport. It's like uh, it's like Dodge City before Marshall Dillon showed up. It's everybody for himself. Um, you know, other sports, the baseball has a national commissioner, football, basketball, boxing has no national commission. Uh, it's every man for himself. Uh, you, you know, it, it, it's so corrupt that, that unless you become part of the corruption, it's hard to move ahead. Um, you know, until there's some centralized authority and, and, and uh, people, you know, know they have to toe the line, this is going to continue. There's just too many larcenous individuals involved, and um, it doesn't matter. Golden Boy, King, Aram, they all play that game. 
Uh, uh, shame. And, 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 you can't take a lesson from uh, you watch the Olympics like during gymnastics if they were unhappy with uh, a decision by the judges they actually could contest it and sometimes the, uh, the decisions like with uh, one of the female gymnasts would get reversed and uh, too bad that can't happen in boxing of course they don't uh, I don't think they have uh, the uh, video thing as in uh, baseball or football which is usually controversial the, the well, video I, well I thought that was one of the best the, the things I, I've ever heard coming out of the Olympics. When they reversed two decisions, I thought that was great. That was great. And, and I would definitely be for it in boxing. If something really looks uh, outlandish and, uh, you know, that uh, the jury says that this really should not stand, then it, I believe a decision should be reversed. Well, uh, the, the, that guy that got knocked down, what, five times, and the ref gave it to him, and then they revealed that the ref was corrupt and revealed, uh, kicked him out of the entire Olympics, sent him home like a drug athlete, and uh, <laughs> gave it to the fighter that should have won. Right. Well, that, that was out and out corruption. I mean, if you went back, if this rule was retroactive in professional boxing, you would have to reverse. I mean, going back to the, the, the I remember seeing in the garden, who was Lennox Lewis and um, Evander Holyfield. Do you remember that fight? Yep, sure. um, where they, they called it a draw, and uh, Lennox Lewis won practically every round, and they found out that the, the female judge was on King's payroll. And it was, I mean, it was, it, that decision, along with about 50 other decisions, uh, if you reverse them, they, they, you know, then you'd have to rewrite boxing history. But that decision should have been reversed. I'm all for a rule like that in professional boxing, absolutely. And that that would start to chip away at the, you know, some of the corruption. Because if they knew, of course. Okay. All right. I was, I was going to talk some old school. I just couldn't recall if Duran had fought either guy. So he fought Tommy Hearns, too? I don't know. I don't recall he, that. Duran was, Duran was almost annihilated by Tommy Hearns in two rounds. It's one of the most spectacular knockouts in the history of the sport. Um, he was knocked out in two rounds and was virtually overwhelmed by the power of Tommy Hearns. Great. But total legend there. Ev? Now, now, and that's a good, that's interesting you bring that up because, you know, when you, when you go back and you think about, like I talked about Roberto Duran, who I consider a great fighter, but, um, you know, people place Roberto Duran, the more modern fans, as number one lightweight of all time. And I think those people basically are not aware of the history of the sport as it involves a fighter like Ike Williams the great lightweight champion in the 1940s, or Bo Jack, Bob Montgomery, um, going back further, Tony Canzanieri, Barney Ross, uh, or the great Benny Leonard. I mean, these are fabulous fighters who I place ahead of Roberto Duran. That's not demeaning Duran. The very fact that he can be placed in these people, in these fighters' companies says something. But that's what my book is all about to explain why would I choose a Tony Canzanari over a Roberto Duran. I'm just not in the bar saying, ah, he can beat you, what do you know? No, I, I give reasons. I interview the, some of the top trainers in the business, including Manny Stewart, um, Freddie Roach, Teddy Atlas, and, and some old-timers who unfortunately have since passed on. Um, no, other book, no other book contains the information that, that is in the arc of boxing. So... You know, if anybody wants to have a debate, I'll be happy to debate them. But one one requirement that read, they read my book first, then we'll have the debate. <laughs> okay, Mike. In your last in your last appearance on the show, you said that Victor Ortiz, compared to the old timers, would be nothing more than a club fighter. I think you right. proved that right after his last fight. Tell the listeners how to get your book. We have to wrap it up. Okay, there are two ways. They, they, of course, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's the ARC, A-R-C, the ARC of Boxing by Mike Silver, or they can go to my website and I will give it to them at a very steep, anybody wants to buy it, a steep discount and I will autograph the book. If they just go to MikeSilverBoxing.com, MikeSilverBoxing.com, uh, if they want to order the book, I will give it to them $20 off the price on Amazon. Wow, that's wow. big. There yeah. You go. There you go. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much, and we hopefully will get you back in a few months and talk some more boxing. Really do appreciate it. My pleasure. Always, always a lot of fun to do this, Evan. Uh, you got it. And we will be right back with CNN and 
wrestling uh, journalist Mark Nowatoski. We will be right back, folks. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Bye, Mike. Okay. All right, Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio, and we're going to shift from boxing to wrestling with the original chic documentarian, Mark Nowatoski. How are you tonight, Mark? Not too bad, Evan. How are you today? Um, I'm good. I'm good, except for my uh, battle with Time One, a cable that I'm still uh, reeling from, but I won't bore you with that. So, uh... well, sorry to hear that. There you go. That could be a show in and of itself. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, Mark, um, I've been enjoying the uh, DVD, and the Sheik was a fascinating character. And this came to my mind while I was watching it. You you have a panel of ac- experts watching the Sheik's matches and commentating on him in the ring and outside the ring. And there's like gr- there's great love and great passion for the Sheik and what he did. And at the same time, it's briefly mentioned, the Sheik would put little raises on his fingers, and when the fans would attack him, he would start slicing and dicing. So this is an interesting guy who's like a family man, a beloved husband, father, but also has that other side to him. What, what, what did you take on that as the filmmaker? Well, he certainly didn't seem to uh, want to take any risks, you know, naturally in regards to his own personal safety. Uh, when it came to juicing, uh, if it was him that was doing it, it, naturally it was okay, but, you know, not being too keen on trying to have a fan get a little overzealous with him. Okay. So, so you find that um, to be excusable behavior? I wouldn't say excusable, but let's say it was just a way of being thought of, of, of protecting oneself. Just as uh, was mentioned uh, in, the, in the documentary from uh, his bodyguard, there was a gentleman that apparently tried to throw a two-by-four at him, and the bodyguard stepped in the way and got the bump in the head. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so uh, it was dangerous back in the day when fans... He didn't quite realize it was a work, and uh, the old time is, you know, got themselves into literally riots. Johnny Valiant told me the Valiant brothers were wrestling one day, and the fans actually rioted and were stomping him, and uh, Butcher Paul Vachon saved his life, literally saved his life. Well, that certainly does show that the that the mystique, if you will, of old of what is today called old school wrestling certainly did do its magic you know people knew who the good guy was and people knew who the bad guy was and if they didn't like the bad guy they made it quite well known and the sheik was naturally famous or more to the point infamous in that regard and ironically in real life many times it was the exact polar opposite where many of the bad guys in the ring were wonderful guys outside the ring and some of the good guys were egomaniacs so you know it was uh, it's it's an interesting psychology if you really uh, look at it from that point of view well that's been told to me too and there it's it's kind of a just as you say it's amazing how the the personalities can do a complete 180 degree turn in their private life. But again, that was part of the mystique of and what spe- is today called old school. And speaking of mystique, I saw the Sheik when, when he was, I guess you would say, past his prime in the 90s. And um, he still was absolutely fierce. I saw him wrestle Kevin Sullivan and Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, on the East Coast in Philadelphia, and when he walked out, even the so-called smart fans, they 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 like, feared the guy because he had this incredible persona. Tell tell the listeners a little about that. Well, that's exactly it. The the persona of the Sheik. The Sheik kept that persona at almost any given time, uh, as is mentioned in the documentary. If if he was in a public place and a fan came up to him and actually recognized him, he would go right into the chic persona, uh, talking the gibberish, uh, looking up to the sky to Allah. Uh, the chic, as as time progressed, just had that persona down so perfectly that just a gaze from him would would make almost anybody you know, whether they're wise, quote-unquote, or not, head for the hills, or at least go the other way. 
I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mike because I know he was a friend uh, and a huge supporter of the Sheik as well. Dr. Mike? Uh, hey, Mark. I haven't talked to you in, in ages. I, I don't know. When we had you on the last time and I talked to you, uh, and hopefully uh, you're going to be doing that second docu, which I can get into, but I think I told you, I, mine wasn't the only fan club, but in 66 I had the West Coast fan club for the Sheik and then later assumed the Blassie and Tolis brothers. I actually started. It was the first... Tolis Brothers fan club, and they all had history with Eddie, and uh, I still consider him, as I'm sure you do, the greatest heel of all time, bar none, and I took pictures of him in uh, Toronto, in Montreal against Don Leo Jonathan, Toronto many times, like against Killer Kowalski in a great heel versus heel, spectacular, uh, against Tiger Jeet Singh, Abby, uh, shot him in Japan, and even in Atlanta against uh, Bobo and I think Ox Baker. Yeah, Ox Baker at the Atlanta City Auditorium. But um, there was, you know, Evan brought up that uh, that Philly show, the Joel Goodhart TWA shows, uh, which I was there shooting, and uh, Evan, I think, went together to those. And in the back, I don't know if I told either of you guys this, but Evan, I told this, uh, when the Sheik came in, he was like the last guy to arrive in the dressing room, and all of the talent, we're talking about the absolute best talent in that locker room, Mick Foley, Luna Bashan, Terry Funk, Kevin Sullivan, Eddie Al Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert, Medusa, on and on, they all started bowing when uh, Sheik and Sabu arrived, and that was Joel's la very last show, where Sheik and Abby went on, uh, I think at the end, and... and uh, we almost all had to lobby for his nephew, Sabu, who Goodhart had not heard of yet. He'd only done Memphis with Rob Van Dam, another chic trainee, uh, to lobby to get him into that opening battle royal. But um, why? let me ask you, uh, in looking over all the stuff, I know why, but you're going to have a different perspective. Why was Sheik, I think he main evented uh, as a heel in more territories and in more places uh, particularly Japan. He really helped Bob get all Japan going in 1973. Uh, how do you explain that? Was it just the uniqueness of the character and Eddie's devotion and perfection of it? Well, a combination of things. And first of all, Mike, it's, it's good to hear from you again. I look forward to seeing you again in the not-too-distant future. Um, regarding the Sheik, well, the Sheik, just his, his mystique, his style, his personoa, was was without a doubt, and I agree with you a thousand percent. He was the the greatest villain I believe in in professional wrestling history. Uh, the fact that when the Sheik was coming to any given town, whether big or small, the rule was there were no no rules. You know, you knew it was going to be absolute chaos, and you knew that you were going to see something that chances were very strong you weren't going to forget. If, uh, if you were a television fan of any given territory, and I'm speaking generally of fans, uh, and you, you were happy with watching uh, the bouts on television, if it was announced that the Sheik would be coming to town, where, you know, in a territory he would only infrequently uh, arrive at, you made it a point to go to those bouts and see the Sheik. And then naturally that would, that would increase uh, the attendance for any given promoter, help things out, help the gate, of course. But you knew you were going to see something that that you weren't going to you weren't going to forget for a long time. And uh, I've got to say, uh, forgot to mention too. He was, of course, such good friends with Fritz von Erich even before they were promoters, going to the annual Vegas NWA conventions. That Fritz would have him come in to Dallas all the time. It really, there was no place that Sheik did not work. All unique territories. Of course, getting banished from both the St. Louis Keel Auditorium and Wrestling at the Chase after the Pat O'Connor debacle when the Sheik, Eddie Farhat, completely disobeyed Sam Muchnick's edict to keep it in the ring. <laughs> uh, but one thing I want people to know was how sweet he was and nice uh, at, at uh, the, um, I forget the kid's name now, the young guy that passed away that had that indie show, uh, Gordon Scazzari, Sheik saw that a lot of money was being burnt, and uh, you know he felt badly. Not all the boys would get uh, paid, and blah blah blah. So he took everyone out to breakfast, and for some reason he had this rep of being cheap, and you know might uh, you know it just when he was a promoter he enjoys for promoting Kobo, etc. And um, 
you know, he said, will you please tell Meltzer that I, you know, he just wanted it known. And he it was never that way. He was extremely generous and a loving guy, of course. I mean, I saw both sides of him because I managed him on the Scazzari shows and some other ones. Uh, but I would not even say I'm in the same league because there were just a couple of indie shows. Uh, Dave Brzezinski did far more of that. And, and obviously the gold standard. That I, I tried to melt my character after both Ernie Roth as Abdullah Farouk the Weasel and the great Eddie Creechman, who were the greatest oh, yeah. of all chic managers. No one like him. You, you have to see Mark's documentary that's just wonderful to get the full color of this. I think the chic took what Gorgeous George did. And ramped it up because he had uh, you know stuff going on in the ring. He had the slave girl, which was Joyce's, uh, uh, you know, the princess, and uh, all of these things. And taking all the time, these little nuanced things, you know, to, to make sure he was praying to the east with the prayer rug and the beautiful outfits that he would wear, and uh, the attention to detail in, in just his ring garb and and the the fire in L.A. where. Uh, I shot him uh, helping turn Fred Blassie babyface in 1970 in two cage matches with Ernie Roth suspended over the ring in a little mini cage. Oh, yes. It was the stuff of legend. The Sheik was a total legend in L.A. where he helped with the book. And uh, just an absolute genius. Uh, so I guess my last thing I'll throw to uh, back to Evan is... Have you heard any more on anybody like Joyce possibly doing a book on the Sheik, or might you take that on? Besides, well, rumor, no, I will not. I will. I, I'll take that as a great compliment. But no, I will. Uh, I will not uh, be writing anything. Uh, it's been rumored that uh, Joyce, with the assistance of the uh, of the remaining family members, may be. But that's been that's been something that's been rumored since. His passing. So with uh, with the years that have gone by, uh, are you going to do a second document? Are, are you uh, hopefully? Well, doing... I am right now. As a matter of fact, as as we speak, I I am uh, currently uh, doing a, another documentary, which I guess you would call an extension. But due to the due to the response of the Sheik, uh, wrestling's greatest villain, uh, I'm doing now the history of professional wrestling in Detroit over the past 50 years and beyond. It wow. brawls, blood, and bouts. So this is going back to the 1950s, right up to today. Uh, so we're, we're speaking of the Sheik's promotion. We're speaking of Dick the Bruisers. We're speaking of Burt Ruby's. We're speaking of uh, the uh, brief George Cannon promotion. After that, it was pretty much independence. Uh, currently, one of the more popular ones is a second-generation uh, promotion called the XICW, which is headed by Malcolm Monroe Jr. His father, Malcolm Monroe, as a matter of fact, in the documentary, Malcolm Monroe Sr. had the final bout with the Sheik in the United States in Lincoln Park, Michigan. And his Malcolm Monroe's son is carrying on the tradition with his promotion XICW. So we're going to be covering a heck of a lot of territory in this next production. Super. There you go. And uh, Mark, uh, Mike said without hesitation, the Sheik was the greatest villain of all time. Others might argue Gorgeous George, Buddy Rogers, Blassie, Kowalski. Where do you rank the Sheik? I... Personally and professionally, I, I rank the Sheik number one. Wrestling's greatest villain, bar none, in the past, in the future. And, and why presently. is that? Why is that? Well, the, the, the word has been used uh, quite a bit over the years, but the man was the innovator. He, he started so many things and sharpened them, no pun intended, in terms of uh, wild craziness, just, you know, uh, in, to the extent of using what has been called foreign objects to quote summoning mystical powers unquote and throwing the fire at the at an opportune moment uh... the man single-handedly i believe and and mike may uh... discuss this either now or at a later point the man i believe caused more riots than any professional athlete in history no got banned from madison square garden remember yeah 1956 oh, yeah. the sheik got banned uh... and uh... Uh, that was that was huge. You're absolutely right on that. 
You know, I mean, anywhere he went, and, and given a perfect example, Mike, is whether, whether somebody was wise to what was going on or, or a, quote, fan. Uh, all it took was the sheik turning around, and you ran. Or, <laughs> you know, uh, how, many, how many athletes, how many performers, how many personalities do you know in, over the past hundred years that have been able to do that? Just by a look. Dogs get scared when they see Michael Vick, but that's like a different deal, I think. I'm not I'm not I'm not making a joke out of it. What the guy did was horrible. But anyway, Mark, we, we have only a minute or two left. So when you think of the Sheik, what what are some of your greatest memories? What matches in particular? Or maybe it was outside the ring on a personal level. Well, I would say that my my most vivid memories are are bouts uh, inside the ring. Almost any bout with the Sheik against Dick the Bruiser. Dick the Bruiser, Abdullah the Butcher, whether being a tag team partner or an opponent. Pompero Furpo, who was called the eighth wonder of the world before Andre the Giant, as a matter of fact. Uh, any number of and Fred Blassie, of course. I mean, absolute absolute bloodbaths. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, with any number of opponents. But Johnny Valentine, that was one of the greatest feuds. The Sheik oh, and Valentine. Oh, yes. Uh, Valentine in, in those Texas death matches, or, or when the Sheik, uh, at least on one occasion, threw the fire at Valentine here in Detroit at Cobo Arena. Oh, yeah. I mean, almost any given Sheik bout, uh, given from the mid 1960s right up into the uh, late 1970s. And even beyond that, he, I mean, the, the movements may have been a little slower, not as fluid, but the movements were there, and the, the mystique was there, the power was still there. It, just as you had mentioned, in Philadelphia in the 90s. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the things I, I've enjoyed very much in your documentary and in the extras as well are the clippings. I'm a sucker for old newspaper clippings. And just to see <laughs> Sheik versus Blassie, Sheik versus uh, Bobo, it just brings back such incredible memories. And uh, I wish I had seen more of him live. Unfortunately, I only saw him a handful of times. But, um, you know, just the uh, the videos I've seen, and I like to hurt people, of course, and, uh, you know, just, just one of the all-time greats. And, and as an old-school fan, and as a movie fan, and as a documentarian, I recommend this film, and I hope the listeners will support it. So, Mark, please tell the listeners how they could get your movie. Well, if you go to the website, I-N-S-E-N-T dot net. That's Independent News Service. Once again, that's I-N-S-E-N-T dot net. Click the store, and then I believe it's going to be to the left. Click where it says the Sheik. You'll click a, a link, and you'll be writing an email directly to me. And it's a two-DVD disc set, shrink-wrapped, UPC-coded. And uh, if you're a fan of old school or are a historian of old school, fans... Please give it great consideration, and I can't go any any uh, getting compliments from you, Evan and and Mike. Uh, once again, it's good to hear from you. How how could you go wrong? It's a five star documentary. It's perfect for anyone who loves wrestling. And, and for all the and for all the fans who uh, complain about WWE and corporate wrestling today, put your money where your mouth is and support projects like this. Seriously. Put your money where your mouth is. Instead of buying the latest uh, pay-per-view, which is going to generally be stultifying and overpriced, support indie filmmaking. Support old school. Support this film, ladies and gentlemen. Mark, unfortunately, we must run. We have two more guests, including the legendary Chuck McCann. But thank I'm you so much for... To that. There you go. Thank you so much for appearing again on Legends Radio. Really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. It's my pleasure. All right, Evan Ginsberg back Evan Ginsberg back with Legends Radio and you were listening earlier in the show to a uh, great set of music from this next gentleman. We are honored to have on the show Shabu. How are you tonight? All right, all right. How you doing? Good, good. Tell the listeners a little about yourself. We heard a whole set of your music about fifteen minutes earlier in the show. Well, first of all, I've been doing music over twenty years and I've been doing all types of music, uh, R&B, hip-hop, 
reggae. Started out being a drummer when I was 10 years old and with my brothers and sisters in the band and sold my drum set for a set of turntables. And from the turntables, it ended off me being in the studio making tracks. There you go. And who are some of the musicians that influenced you? What did you say? Say it again. Who are some of the musicians that influenced you? Oh, well, uh, like a Dr. Dre. Uh, uh, There's a whole lot of old artists. Stevie Wonder. Uh, uh, shoot. Uh, it's a lot of artists that influenced me uh, from, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, boy. Easy D. Um, uh, let me see. It's two artists, but uh. And hello? tell us, yeah, tell us about some of the tracks that we heard yeah. earlier in the show. What do you say? How come you're having trouble hearing us for some reason? Yes, a little, a little. Okay. Tell us about tell us about some of the tracks we heard earlier in the show. Oh, some of the tracks that I made, I made a, two R and B tracks. It uh, has something to do with uh, you know uh, artists like Usher, R. Kelly. I mean, I you know I, I kind of make tracks for for artists like that, and uh, tracks for like artists like. Uh, uh, it was EPMD. Uh, uh, shoot, um, boy, I'm kind of a little nervous here, but I, I'll get it together. Uh, nothing to uh, be nervous about. I hear you. Um, I make I make tracks for some some everybody. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not some every some everybody. Okay, okay, and we have Dr. Mike Leno in, in California. Dr. Mike. Uh, we often talk about the uh, the acts that we love, the great musical acts that sometimes get stuck having to perform outside the U.S., where, you know, like Europe or Asia, uh, where they're treated with proper respect, like the legends they are. And uh, w what can we do to, to, you know, get more of that back to this country? Because... You know, the music industry, maybe it's just because of the, the corporate types and all that have almost ruined things. You know, the Internet has had its obvious effects. But do you have any thoughts or suggestions or, or stuff that you'd like to see to in this country to help things out, help artists like yourself? Oh, sure. I would like, like my tracks to be some everywhere. I mean, anywhere I could get them, I sure would like to have my tracks overseas if I can or uh, if you need to see if I can. I'm I'm trying to just get, get my tracks out there. I've been doing this thing for like I said, I'm almost close to twenty years and you know, I got like local artists around the way but I wanted to reach out there, you know, to the whole industry, the whole world. I want the whole world to hear these tracks. So that I can uh, you know I like to have a nice soundtrack out there. For a movie or anything, I anything that work for me right about now. All right, I'll throw it back to Evan since we're having some audio stuff. And okay. tell the listeners about some of the um, young talent that you've been uh, supportive of. Uh, as far as uh, on, on my on my roster, are you talking about? Right. Sure. Oh yeah. Well, I have two or three artists. Uh, this guy named Cool. You know, he constantly is out here getting himself tracked out, and he's all on Facebook, and he's on everything, you know. And then I got another guy named Danger D, and, uh, you know, he's doing his doing his stuff, but he's doing it kind of slow. And I got another artist, Cool Ray. He, he made a record, made a hit like 20 years ago, and he's trying to come back out, getting his thing together, and... I got a female artist named Jay Saz. She she's all over doing a lot of things. Like it's hard for me to even keep up with her right about now, but she's doing big things now too. I'm trying to get a get a nice record going with her, but like I said, she's hard to catch up to right about now. 
And as someone who's been in the business for 20 plus years, what advice would you give to young people that are just dealing with, you know, it's a tough, tough business. Right. Well, um, the advice is don't give up. Keep trying. And, you know, like me, I, I've been doing it, like I said, for 20 years and I haven't stopped one day yet. I've been just keep going and, and you get discouraged and think that it's not going to happen for you before you know it, it can happen. I mean, I had, I have done a lot of stuff the local in the hood, and, you know, shows and, and, and block parties and all types of stuff. But like I said, they'll just, for the, for the listeners, just don't, don't give up and just keep going until it, it, it'll, it'll happen. Just keep, keep, keep it, keep it going. And I find it interesting that you started out as an R&B musician and you're very open to hip-hop. A lot of the R&B acts, you know, aren't as acceptive, accepting of uh, hip-hop. I, I happen to enjoy and appreciate both, but uh, what, what's your take on that? Uh, well, I started out really on hip-hop, really. And it merged to uh, club R and B. Oh, I got you. Uh, I got you. Yeah. I mean, I'm really a really a, a all a all listener. I, I listen to everything: reggae, R and B, hip hop, club, uh, techno. Uh, I listen to everything. But as far as me making tracks, I make I I make mostly all of those type of tracks too. But. Uh, Hip hop is really what I started out with, and it merged to R and B and club, and you know the rest. I I happen to love the hip hop artists um, more so the old school guys, but a lot of the uh, indie guys today that have something positive to say. Like uh, I I kind of grew up with uh, De La Soul and um, okay. Run DMC and. Right. You know, Kumo D, you know, uh, not the gangster stuff, which, uh, and the materialistic stuff that gets uh, to be a bit much. But a lot of the indie hip hop artists in the New York area, you know, uh, a lot of guys out there, So Soon, Cooley High, Ms. P, et cetera, so on, uh, they have a lot of socially important things to say. And I think uh, the commercial hip hop, to an extent, um, has has a negative stigma in 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 a in certain sense because uh, there's a lot of materialism, sexism. You know, uh, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, you you're right about that. I'm kind of like yeah, uh, the uh, the new hip hop today. You right, it's all about the gunfire and all that stuff. You right about that. I I mean. I'm trying to stay away from that type of stuff myself, but I mean, it seems like that's what that's what's out there now. And I mean, I'm trying to get in where I fit in. That it's not really like I have a choice of trying to stay away from the, uh, the negative hip hop, but it's it's out there all over. It's, it's like you can't you can't escape from it. So I mean, but if I can find a spot where I can get away from it. Sure, I would like to like to be in that in that predicament. Yeah, what I have found going to hip hop shows in New York in recent years is there's never any problem. You know, you have um, you have a, a, an audience that appreciates the music, every race, creed, and color, even different ages. You know, in the audience and. Yeah, everybody gets along, and everybody has a great time, and I've never seen any problems at a New York hip-hop show. But then you have, um, you know, uh, Drake and uh, Chris Chris Brown throwing throwing $2,000 bottles at each other's heads right. like, geni like right, geniuses. Right. And then all of a sudden, club owners and everybody else are scared to book hip-hop shows. Right, right, you're right. Um I really don't know what's going on in the industry, and I, I like to, to, I like to hit the industry, but when it deals and dealing with stuff like that at that club or that night, I, if 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 I have to enter that 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 maze of of, 
of violence, uh, I, I'd rather stay out of it. I'd rather stay home. I mean, stay back out of it. I mean, yeah. you know, one, I wouldn't be blowing two grand on a bottle. Two, if I did, I wouldn't be throwing at somebody. I'd be drinking it, you know? It's <laughs> kind, of, kind of absurd if you think about it. So, uh, anyway, um, tell us what you have coming up. If you have any uh, CDs coming up coming out any uh shows anything you'd like to plug we'd love to hear it uh sure i have a uh, a few artists doing a few things and i sure would like to to go to one of your shows and and uh audition for a, a, you know a show you said you do shows on wednesdays and fridays or something like that uh, i remember the last time i talked to you and tuesdays like say, and fridays gotta, tuesdays and fridays oh, tuesdays. down at yeah, down at Gizzy's, 16 West 8th, yes, yes. Okay, and, uh, you know, I have, like I said, this female named Jay Sides, and she's, uh, she does, she does R&B, hip-hop, club, she, she does it all, so, I mean, I like to have a, have a little, a little, uh, thing going on down there, if, if, if you know, if you welcome me down there, I mean, definitely we'll be there. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely talk off air and uh what about any uh cds that you have uh coming out or available that and for any of your artists that you'd like to plug well at this time no i don't have this if they are there in the making they won't be dropping until maybe sometime in uh boy like december so that's that's a little little time for now because i'm trying to build the right artists, like you say, as far as coming out with those with those hip hop records that has female bashing and gun gunfire. I'm trying to get the right artists to keep away from that and that's that's what I'm I'm working on. And it takes a little time to give these artists that don't rap particularly that, that type of that type of rap. Rap a clean rap, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. A buddy of mine was uh, producing rap videos for the biggest names in the business, and uh, the record companies pretty much kept having them make the same video. You know, you had the girls in bathing suits, you had the jewelry, you had the cars. You know, so finally he would he would go to the record companies and say, "Listen, I want to make a different video." And they go, no, 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 you have to do that same video. The girls are covered in soap, you know, it's ridiculous, you know. So uh, I have nothing but respect for artists that, uh, you know, go for something on a more spiritual, uh, sophisticated level. And uh, we're glad you're doing what you're doing. And um, anyway, tell the listeners how they could get in touch with you if you have a website or, you know, social media. Oh, or yes, whatever the case a, may be. Yeah, I have a Facebook. Uh, it's at uh, twshabu at gmail dot com, and I'm on Twitter. Same thing, gwshabu at gmail dot com, and uh, you can catch me on on those. There you go, and that's s h a b o o, correct? Right. Yeah, G W Shabu. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, well. Anyway, we must wrap it up. We have a uh, legendary performer. Talk about old school, Chuck McCann, who uh, was a um, talk show host back in the uh, '60s, uh, a kid show host, I should say. Uh, tr- tremendous uh, talent. Uh, he's made movies and everything else. But uh, Shabu, we loved your music and we enjoyed having you on. Thank you so much for appearing on Legends Radio. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You got it. And, folks, we will be right back with the great Chuck McCann right after this. And I also want to give a brief shout-out to Mark Bujan. Feel better, my friend. We will be right back after this. All right, everybody. Well, they said this last night on America's Got Talent. They saved the cream of the crop, the absolute best for the end of the show. And uh, this is a gentleman we had on a couple of years ago who everyone loves. And I I know New York sort of uh, sees them as one of their own, but I'm up here in the Northern California. I grew up in L.A., was a total fan. I, I idolized this guy, the one and only legendary Chuck McCann. And not I only does... Michael! Yay! 
Yeah. You are, you are the consummate legend. But you not only have a new book out, not, and I want to yeah. thank Connie at Filmland Classics, filmlandclassics.com uh, for helping. But the, uh, the book is out. But the big thing is coming to see Chuck McCann's Let's Have Fun reunion party with Chuck, friends, wow. live and in person. It's a special book release event. Cool stuff. Everything that you love. If you love children, classic kids TV, it is Sunday, September 16th from 1 to 5 p.m. at the Meadowlands Plaza Hotel, 40 Wood Avenue, Secaucus, New Jersey. It is very rare. Chuck doesn't do these kind of, you know, oh. it's a whole show book signing thing there's going to be some of his old puppets i believe on display and oh, i'm looking yeah. at his fantastic website chuck mccann.net the incredible one and only chuck mccann chuck how are you doing oh just great michael how are you doing babe it's been a while how long about two years well it's been about two years the show is called legends radio and that is what right. you are through and through stage tv oh, well. commercials movies you've done everything didn't you even do some uh well, you've done everything, but you know, for those of us on the West Coast that may, because I don't know, was your your children's show was it like Soupy or Paul Winchell's, where it was syndicated, or were people only no, in the? Well, what happened was uh, in those early early days, what they did was they, uh, you know, when they finally developed cable, uh, I, they they cabled me up up, up the East Coast a little bit. I know it was seen in some of the New England states. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Philly uh, got got me if they had a big enough antenna. This is the ancient days of television, you know. I mean, I started when I when I first started. It was like very I was very very young, and uh, then I wound up doing a lot of television in New York while I was doing my show. Like I would I would bounce on the Dick Cavett show, or I would bounce on the Gary Moore show. And then I'd go back and do my show, too. So I, I had a lot of people were, like, aware of me, but they weren't, you know, uh, they weren't watching. I, I I really didn't know exactly how popular I was, if I was at all, in New York, really, except that I, I you know, they I had some, my picture on a bus every once in a while, and, you know, people recognize few people recognize me and then eventually it got to the point where I got it was I'd go into a restaurant but I I never shunned away from them I I believe that if you can't stand the heat get out of the kitchen you know so that's all part of it and I, I love it I, it's just fabulous well this event will easily sell out because people from all over the world love you you know so People, I think, on the West Coast, you know, where almost everything comes out of, even though there's significant TV and movies being filmed in New York, yeah. they may not have known all of the aspects and nuances of you, but I consider you like an Ernie Kovacs uh, okay. in that you, with, you know, very little in those early TV days, you could hold people's attention and entertain the hell out of millions and millions <laughs> and millions of people with a puppet, some props, cartoon, whatever. And nowadays they need all the special effects and all this post pro and all this stuff, but you didn't have that, and and that's why oh. you guys I think were were the classic entertainers that could do everything, singing, well, dancing, especially especially Sandy. I mean Sandy Becker was uh, that's another name that people don't know probably up in the you know in the, in San Francisco or in Northern California, but. He was very, very, very popular in New York City, and he's the one who got me into doing children's shows uh, in front of the camera. I was doing a lot of puppets and stuff with Paul Ashley, and my my brother, father, mentor, and everything. I I, lo I love Paul, and and we were doing a lot of great puppets and stuff like that. He was he was uh, the best and a great sculptor. And, we we did a lot of crazy things. I I pulled him over the puppet stage actually when I started doing this show myself, you know, uh, in front of the camera. And uh, it was Sandy actually who got me started doing that. By I was I, one day I, I he came up to me and said, "Hey Chuck, uh, I, I'm going on vacation, so I want you to do my show." I said, "Oh great!" Now I thought he meant puppets, you know, or do 
some funny voices for him and stuff because I did a lot of commercials. He says, no, no, I'm, I want you to host the show. I went, holy crow. And, in fact, I was sitting with Dick Godier, who was my roommate at that time. We were yeah. living in an ap- apartment hotel in uh, on 49th Street. Uh, all of, We call it the Philadelphian Embassy because all the kids from Philadelphia that came in would stay there. Like, all, I mean, from Eddie Fisher when he first came in. and I mean, everybody from Philly, all the great rock people, and Bobby Darren and all, all the people. So it was just a crazy, wacky uh, kind of uh, a- apartment full of, you know, it was like it was like to play young and willing, you know. Uh, it was just, it just everybody was a, a, a wannabe, and a lot of them became big, big stars, like Mickey Callum, who came out of there and went into West Side Story and then went into movies. I mean, a lot of us just, you know, we were just hopefuls, and, and it was just great fun. So Dick wrote the first week. Uh, we were, wrote all weekend, you know, and I went into the studio to do the show. And, uh, boy, lo and behold, I, I mean, I got, it was a baptism by fire. You know what that means? That means that, you know, they just point the camera at you and say, you're on. And I, I thought, oh, well, I, you know, I've got enough material now here. But I, but I never could get through half of it because... The first minute that I got to the studio, I was standing out in front trying to get in through the door. I write about this in a book, but uh, it, it was so hysterical. I, 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 I was late, uh, and, the, and the show went on at 7 in the morning, and I was, I was standing there for like for a half an hour, and I didn't realize that I was in front of a, a locked door that actually the door was down the street until a stage hand came and said, Chuck, they're looking for you. And I ran in through this other door that he opened for me, and I ran upstairs, and Arnie Knox, the director on the show, he turned to me and said, where are the animals? I said, jeez. So I ran down and got the uh, squirrel and the, the budgie that, Sandy had and the parrot and the raven and all of it. I put them on my shoulder and I ran down the hall. What did I a sight running down the hall with the wings spread and the squirrels scratching the hell out of my jacket. By the time I got finished, the, my jacket looked like a roller uniform. He pulled every thread out of my jacket, the, the little squirrel, you know. But it, it, it just went on and on. It was like a real baptism by fire. Everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong during the, the shooting of that first two-hour show. I, and I said to Sandy, I said, how long is this show? He said, two hours. I said, oh, my God. I said, are you sure you want me to do it? He said, yeah. I said, when are you coming back? He said, the week. And he walked with two bags. He had the luggage ready. And he walked through the elevator. And he said, uh, I'll see you a uh, uh, week from Wednesday. And I said, where are you going? He said, South America. And the doors closed, and then that was it. I was, I was, I was on. I was committed. And uh, so I, as I had the, the – well, when you read the book, you know, it's in the, it's the whole story is in the book. It's very funny what happened. It was crazy. It was a crazy yeah, Of course, uh, we're, we're talking to Chuck McCann, and uh, Chuck McCann, the total legend – Chuck McCann, M C C A N N dot net. Also, Chuck McCann's, that's with an S at the end, let's have fun dot com. And uh, two things very quickly uh, all of the people globally on tvparty.com, most all of them are listening to this interview now. You are a total legend on that site. And that has Aww. all the people, uh, the soupy sales uh, experts, uh, the Paul Winchell experts, the sheriff John, all of the experts on. Uh, TV in general, not just children's television, but also uh, a former world champion pro wrestler who turned uh, actor, screenwriter, director Pepper Martin is listening right now. And he emailed oh, me Pepper, to, uh, yeah. to uh, Pepper, uh, who lives down near you back in my old stomping grounds of Southern Cal, emailed. We had a Cauliflower Alley meeting at the Sportsman's Lodge on uh, Ventura like 20 years ago. <laughs> and I remember... He and I were standing next, and I think we saw you and Stubby K in that uh, very place. Yeah, you know, everybody a- came into those sportsmen's at that time. Well, I mean, the, the wall. If you ever, if anybody from that's listening hasn't been to L.A. and you come to Southern California, 
Okay, the hotel to go to is the Sportsman's Lodge. First of all, they have a, an excellent club that they've opened up now on the other side at night. And they also have uh, the, caf- the cafeteria. It's, like, it's called the cafe. And uh, if you go to the wall at the back of that thing, there's there's a all the legends are up there in 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 marble and one of the they all the great western cowboys that used to work at, at down at Republic and uh, it's up on the on the wall there you you can't you can't miss it it's uh, everybody from John Wayne to to everybody. But here's a can't miss. Before we go to Evan Ginsburg in New York City, Chuck McCann's Let's Have Fun Reunion Party, Sunday, September 16th, from 1 to 5 at the Meadowlands Plaza Hotel in Secaucus, New Jersey. Go to chuckmccann.net, and let's see what else Connie told me to send people to. Uh, let's oh, they, to get they, tickets. They, yeah, they, go they, to they went, Oh, go ahead. Go into my, go into my uh, clubhouse. It's... Uh, there's if you once you go into the once you go into the net there's a link into my clubhouse and I've 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 just got everything posted in that thing just everything there's like uh, two hundred almost close to two hundred videos of mine just bits and pieces and stuff of, that, of my life and I'm constantly putting stuff in there so uh, your your website is totally totally professional chuck mccann m c c a n n dot net or for tickets call 323-999-1475 without further ado evan ginsburg in new york who grew up on chuck that's right hi, sir hi hi i'm uh, 52 years old i've lived in new york my entire life and i have such fond memories of Sandy Becker and Soupy Sales and yourself and uh, why is it that kid shows have gotten away from having you know wonderful hosts doing things live and you know it was well, such a joyful experience. You know it, it's 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 the one thing that's truly missing and I, I'm afraid there was a bunch of ladies in Boston that did that. If they go into if they go into the internet, they can find that information. You know. The demise. There was a, a group of ladies that that uh, felt that the the hosts of those shows were uh, uh, the only people on the show that was selling the products directly to the kids, and they didn't. They thought that was like an infringement, and so they got they all got together, the seven or eight of them there, and uh, they went to the government and fought this, and and so what happened was all the Local stations then had to uh, had to uh, acquiesce to the government, and uh, what they did was they just ran the shows and <laughs> and threw the commercials on, you know, without without hosts leading into them. But they also killed the guy that said, uh, "Be careful crossing the street," and yes, kids uh, go to church on Sunday and be good to each other, even though they're. We're different colors and and we're from different parts of the world. We love each other, and you know that that guy is sorely missing. It was the big brother that they had. It was the father that they had. They didn't have. Uh, sometimes it was the, the best friend that they didn't have. You know, so when they came home from school, there was there we were, and we and we could talk into the lens. They don't talk in the lens anymore. You you they. You communicate through the lens, you know. And I'll go back to anybody. I did mostly comedy and shenanigans, but Captain Kangaroo did that. I mean, and 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 so did Mister Miss uh, his uh, neighborhood, Mister uh, Mister Rogers. Rogers' neighborhood. He 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 was wonderful, and he looked right. He was a good friend of mine too. Looked right into the lens, you know. So that's what we did. I could look in the lens, and I could reach through the lens. And shake hands with you, and that's why that's why I believe that, you know, I I see it now. I see how well it worked, how wonderfully uh, wonderful it was. I mean, I'm I'm getting all of these wonderful responses from all these wonderful kids that grew up. Hey, you know, and you know, you're fifty what two? Fifty two, yes. Okay, good. Now, 
52, and and uh, even those at 60, uh, that I get. Now I'm I'm 76, but I wasn't too far away from you guys when you think about it. When I first started, I started very very young, but right. I was old enough to be your, your big brothers and your uncle and what have you, and so that. That came through, and uh, you know it's it's so wonderful now to meet you guys and to give you a hug and say <laughs> hi and thanks for watching. You know it's it's just so great, man. And if you get this book, the book is fabulous because the book has a video in it, and I do all of my bits. I do a lot of my bits in there, and I'm going to be releasing everything that I have eventually. And this is just the first of that that book with the with the sketches. So that'll take you down memory lane. If you want to show you your kids what I what I I look like and what I did, I think they'll get a kick out of it because it, it's just kind of kind of fun. And my my dear friend Billy Crystal did the forward. I I didn't realize that Billy was like a big big fan of mine, and he was he was. Uh, he was uh, uh, watching me, and so uh, he offered to do the forward to my book. And oh, that's it's, great. It's great. He's so, so flattering and so funny and wonderful. And we got the DVD and then the, the behind the scene pictures that you never saw before, you know? So uh, now to order it, you go to www.chuckbacan.net, links to the order pages. And as he said, you can call 323-999-1475. But I hate, well, please, that's why I don't, I don't like to do these things because I get embarrassed. But uh, it's, it, it's, it's just fun. And I, I realize, you know, from all of my Facebook friends and all of my fans that have, that have gotten back and found me, I'm 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 here for you, and as long as I'm around, we're gonna do some great stuff. I, I, what I'm working now with is a bunch of young kids, and trying to get them going. So we, we're uh, we're we're moving it forward. I would love to put the Chuck McCann show back on the air with some stuff, and who knows through the internet we may be able to do that. You know, through maybe uh, YouTube or something like that in the afternoon, so we could do a kid show for kids, because it is sorely needed you know and it would reach really, a whole new generation that would be great yeah absolutely absolutely and they're they're out there and they're just they're, they're looking they're crying out for uh, these kids you know and, and it's a shame because i think that today a lot of them oh, i hey i'm not saying everybody grew up perfect but boy i'm telling you there's uh, we had a heck of a lot of uh of kids that went on to do great things. I'll give you one example. I was at Kodak, and I'm sitting there, and there's a man sitting there, and uh, he comes over to me. He says, you know, you influenced me when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. I used to watch your show. I said, oh, and he was about 50, 52. And so we're sitting, we're sitting and talking and so forth. So I said, well, that's wonderful. His name was Steve. So I said, gee, Steve, thank you very much for for uh, having watched and everything. He said, well, you, you, you were very influential. He said, uh, I mean, Mike. I said, thank you. I said, uh, so he goes back and he sits down, and the head the guy from uh, Kodak walks over to me, and he says, he says, you, 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 you really uh, hit it off with Steve. I said, yeah. He said, do you know who he is? I said, no. He says, it's Steve Sassoon, the man who invented the digital camera. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, you wouldn't have your your cell phone without Steve Sassoon, you know, uh, or the camera on it or anything else. So, I mean, that, that, that just goes to show you. Not that not, I'm saying I invented, helped him invent the digital camera, but I, at least I, I feel so flattered that I, I was able to entertain guys like that, you know. It was great fun. Oh, great, absolutely, great absolutely. And your career has has been over a half century. I mean, you you've done dramas like The Heart Is a Lonely Hunter. You've done voiceovers for cartoons. You've done tons of commercials. How, how do you sustain a career for a half century? It's amazing. Well, exactly what you said. 
I did it all. And I never, I never looked to become, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse. I mean, I, I didn't want to become the head of the studio, the star. I just, I just loved working, and uh, it was just so much fun. And I just, I had this ability to be able to draw, and I was able to do cartoons and stuff like that. And I did voices, and and all my impressions because of my ear. I was able to do radio when I was younger, and then I I, I took a leap of faith kind of into television, uh, and uh, uh, with puppets with Paul Ashley and doing voices for those things, and it's all in the book. I mean, it's it it really it really goes into detail in the book on how I I first met Paul and how we we started off, and I I I just knew I knew that somewhere down the line. There was going to be, you know, and and you have to have a survival job. You have to be able to earn money, and so uh, I mean to live. You know, you got to put a roof over your head. And so what I would do if 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 the the television ran thin or there was a show, I wound up doing commercials, or I wound up doing uh, voices, or I wound up doing uh, animation, or I'd wind up doing uh, uh, acting. And I, you know, I thank. You know, wonderful uh, Alan Arkin and Adam, his, his son Adam Arkin, he was the one who suggested. He used to watch Let's Have Fun. That's how I got Hard as a Lonely Hunter. They used to watch it together in in New York. So huh. when they were looking for somebody to play Spirit of Santanopolis, uh, they were in London, and he called one day at dinner. Adam said to his father, "Hey, you know Chuck would be good for this." Chuck McCann would be great for this. And the next thing you know, Alan, the, the bulb, a light bulb went over his head, and the next thing he does is call up at Warner Brothers, <clears throat> and the producer calls me. They find me, and the next uh, day or so, they get in touch with me, and I'm up for this movie. So, I, they're, they're, you know, one thing, this whole business is coincidence. It's, a link, it's linking. Everything is linked together. I, I just wrote about that in my uh, in a blog that I did on uh, Kojak. Uh, you know, I mean, I I I did a Kojak, and I did I did it because I was driving down Sunset Boulevard, and there was uh, Tully Savalas hitching a ride. You know, so I picked him up and I drove him to the studio, and the, and and the producer comes out and says, "Hey." Uh, did, did, well, didn't I see you on Colombo a couple of uh, uh, months ago? I said, yeah. He said, gee, you look great in that. He said, how would you like to do our show? And so the, before I know it, uh, I'm, I'm facing Tully a week later uh, on the Kojak show. So, I mean, that's how things happen. You just keep working. You just keep doing. So I would suggest to any young actor coming up, I'm not saying start with a puppet, but <laughs> you you can go out and 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 develop all your facets, you know. Uh, and I'm I'm so glad I did that. My manager used to drive me nuts because I, if I got a, got a movie, he would say, uh, what, "What are you doing that commercial for?" I said, "Well, I'm doing it because I I have to, you know, I have got two kids and I've got to pay the rent. That's why." You know, but what's that going to do to your movie? I said, I don't care. You know, it's just working. It's just the art of, of performing. I always felt that one minute commercial was it's storytelling. The whole damn thing is storytelling. You know, everything is. Uh, uh, that's what this book is. The book is a story. You know, it's, it, it 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 tells a a, a segment of what I did. In, in my life, and all books do. They're stories, and and so are our movie stories. And then you've got dance, ballet is a story. Uh, we tell stories. It's how it's. There are people that can tell a good story, and there are people that don't uh, tell a good story. And I guess I was lucky enough, one of those fortunate enough, to be able to tell a good story. So that that's what it all boils down to. It's storytelling, you know. So whether it would be commercials or cartoons or animation, that's what I love to do. I'm a I'm a storyteller first, 
a comedian and puppeteer and all the rest of that later. But, but the puppets allowed me to do the sets and create, you know, radio was the greatest. That was the theater of the mind. That was, that was the greatest form of storytelling because it left you in your mind to create the sets and, and put the faces on the people. You know, there's nothing scarier in this world. This, you know, movies, forget a movie. A good, scary radio show sitting in the dark in your living room. <laughs> well, let me there tell you, you that, that's you spooky, man. That, yep. is, that is scary because yeah. your mind can put pictures together that like the likes of no Hollywood uh, scenic designer. Believe me, trust me. Uh, that's great. Dr. Mike for the wrap-up. I'm going to wrap up really quickly. Um, just one thing. I know Jerry Seinfeld is also a Chuck McCann fan, but remember when Michael Richards got his TV Emmy Award, he grew up like I did in L.A. on a children's show host on Channel 11 uh, named uh, Sheriff John, who also did you know the voice. Right, of Sheriff the- John was very popular here in L.A. He, but he thanked him in his acceptance speech, and, and Sheriff John at that point was in his 70s. I don't know how many years ago. Uh-huh. Like, 1995, he asked him to stand up at the Emmy Awards. He actually brought him, and it was a very emotional moment for everybody. So here's Michael Richards, the main guy he's thanking for his career, was a children's show you know, that he absolutely loved, as we loved Chuck McCann's show. So, uh, right. Chuck, I'm going to be revealing this to my newspaper column. What's the title of the book? Is it called Let's Have Fun, or what's the title? It's called Let's Have Fun, Chuck. Uh, Let's Have Fun, Scrapbook. Chuck McCann's Let's Have Fun Scrapbook. And uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a gorgeous thing. I watch it come off the press. So it's, it's really beautiful. And, and Connie and, Ra, uh, and Ray Ferry uh, wrote it, and uh, they put it together. And Connie is my little orphan Annie. Every time you go into my website, you see little orphan Annie is Connie. I deemed her little orphan Annie because she's been in charge of my, she's been in charge of my my life right now with this with the party and all of this. So we're just having a good time. It's just fun. Well, much so, many thanks. Connie's at FilmlandClassics.com. Of course, the event Sunday, September sixteenth, one to five at Meadowlands Plaza Hotel, Forty Wood Avenue, Secaucus, New Jersey. There's going to be tons of stuff going on besides your ability to. Me. Yeah, I'm bringing, I'm, I'm bringing a lot of stuff at the party. I'm bringing my films. I'm bringing some of my puppets. Uh, I'm going to bring some of the puppets that I had from Let's Have Fun. Uh, and also I'm going to bring the Laurel and Hardy and Chuck puppets. So they're the ones on the cover. And so they can go in and take a look at them, and uh, I'm going to work them. Greg Marin, a friend of mine, is going to come in and help me puppeteer. We've got some great... And I'm going to get get up and do some bits for you, and uh, do some a little bit of a show for you, and we're going to have uh, uh, hors d'oeuvres and you know a little bit of food, uh, uh, just uh, little things that uh, to munch on. So if they, in case anybody gets hungry during the, we'll have drinks there and so forth and so on. So it'll it'll be nice. It'll be very nice. It's a party, and that's what it is. It's a party atmosphere. It's, and it's, it's a totally a, rare a because you don't do this with, stuff. It's with, rare. With, with, yeah. Huh? It's, it's totally rare. You don't do this, you know. So go to chuckmccann.net. I never do it. Are you kidding? No. I, it's the last thing you're in the too, world. You're too, you know, you're always too busy at your age doing a million things. <laughs> well, but people, it's, not, well, it's not that I'm too busy. I, 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 I'm embarrassed that when people throw me a party, I, you know. So, but anyway, this, uh, so they're doing this, you know, for the for the kind of get. The whole thing started because we, we we created a network. We're going to be doing a network of stuff on the internet. I I just see the internet is like television to me. It's like brand new. It's a place where, you know, like like you can. There's a whole big article on Larry King today in the paper about him on uh, Hulu. You know, and so I mean, a, a lot of these people that get thrown away and and, and you know or. or uh, you know, you think are too old. They, they've got a lot to offer, and uh, so I mean, if you if you if you want to see some of the stuff, or you want to just trip back to memory lane, all of my stuff is there for you to see. Uh, it's like me going back and watching Sid Caesar. I loved Sid Caesar. I'm, uh, I'm comparing myself to Sid, 
But I, I, that, I, there was one incident that I, I went up to Max Lieberman's house, not knowing it was Max Lieberman, and he was selling homes uh, one time in Long Island. And I went up, knocked on the door, and he invited me in, and he, he recognized me, and he, and he told me who he was, and he had his toupee on. It was like kind of crooked. <laughs> he said to me, he said, you know, he said. You know, you, you you know, Chuck. You always reminded me a little bit of Sid because of your 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 mind and, and the way you perform. And I, I, that to me was very very flattering. I loved that. I loved Kovacs. Of course, I I knew Ernie and I knew uh, his wife Edie, who just passed away. God rest her soul. Lived like four doors from me here in L.A. So we were, we were very close and. Uh, I just saw I just saw Ed the other night in Mad Man Mad Mad World uh, at the Academy with Mickey Rooney and Billy Crystal was there and it was just so marvelous. So you know, old is new again, and uh, now that with uh, Clip Clipsitch, they have a way now of taking uh, all these films and making 3D movies out of them. You know, so they, who knows? You may see my stuff in 3D one day. You know, so. But the it, so Chuck, we've got to we've got to go. I don't I don't want to be. I'm going to call you in a day or two. But whether you grew up on Chuck McCann in the the East Coast, whether you love just an absolute legend, children's TV at its best. Go to chuckmccann.net. The event Sunday, September 16th. That's it for everybody here at Legends Radio. Obviously. Evan Ginsberg, our boss, and I uh, want to thank all of our guests tonight. And that is it. Make sure you go to chuckmccann.net. That's it. Over and out here. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You.